a master storyteller and one of the top media executives in the world, Ben Sherwood most recently served as co-chairman of Disney Media Networks and president of Disney ABC Television Group. An award-winning journalist, he also spent four years as president of ABC News. Consistently ranked in the Hollywood Reporter's annual list of the most powerful people in entertainment, Ben offers game-changing insights on bold leadership in times of disruption, the art of the turnaround, and the secrets of unleashing creativity and innovation. At Disney ABC, Ben managed a $12 billion business with 12,000 employees that were responsible for the creation of more than 25,000 hours of original content every year. With new streaming services and technology upending business models and consumer behavior, Ben and his team consistently delivered outstanding results measured in profitability, cultural relevance, and creative excellence. As a New York Times best-selling author, Ben's research-based book, The Survivor's Club, The Secrets and Science That Could Save Your Life, is published in more than 15 languages. Let's welcome Ben Sherwood to the summit stage. Thank you. Thank you very much. Greetings to all of you here and around the world. And can we pause for a moment about Pete Oakes and that powerful and profound moment when he described what business is really all about. It's not about the bottom line, it's about people, and it's about making a difference in transformation. It's a great pleasure to be here today, and as a longtime Walt Disney Company employee, I should note that the birthplace of Walt Disney is not far from here, it's just 28 miles in fact, at the corner of Tripp Avenue and Palmer Street in the Hermosa neighborhood of the northern suburbs of Chicago. And it was there that Walt was born, and at about the age of four, he moved about six and a half hours away to Marceline, Missouri. And that's the place some of you may know that a doctor nearby paid Walt to draw a picture of his horse. And so began Walt Disney's illustrious career. Walt came back to Chicago during World War I and attended McKinley High School where he was a cartoonist on the student newspaper and he attended the Chicago Academy of Fine Arts. This was the place, Chicago, Missouri, Kansas, where Walt Disney was forged during a period of war and went on to become truly one of the world's greatest storytellers, disruptors, and leaders. I'm here to tell you that Walt Disney's record of 26 Academy Awards, 26 Oscars, will never ever be matched. 24 of them were for competitive categories, the others were in honorary categories. It's an extraordinary level of achievement. My topic today is leadership in disrupted and changing times. And here at this leadership summit, I come to you and stand in front of you with a tremendous amount of humility. Humility because in my own industry, media, things are changing so rapidly, one day is almost like a dog year. Just think about it. It took 448 years between Gutenberg's invention of the printing press and movable type in Germany. It took 448 years until Marconi invents the radio. From that point, the invention of the radio to Philo Farnsworth's television transmission took only 33 years. And from that point to the advent of the internet, and the advent of mobile phones, and the advent of social media has taken just decades and years. The pace of change is so rapid that some futurists believe that the next 100 years will see the equivalent of 20,000 years of human progress to date. 100 years ahead, 20,000 years of human progress. Now, as a former journalist, I have to tell you that, that prospect is exhilarating. It's exciting because change means news and news is good for journalists. But as leaders, ladies and gentlemen, that amount of change, that speed of change is daunting, right? 
It's a little bit scary to think how fast things are moving. And so what I'd like to talk to you today is about how to lead in a time of crisis and how to lead in a time of rapid change and disruption. And what I'm going to draw on is my experience at the highest levels of the Walt Disney Company, also my experience 30 years traveling the world as a journalist and ultimately as the leader of ABC News in New York, and finally, in some very formative experiences when I wrote a book about 10 years ago about the secrets and the science of the men and women who have overcome the greatest adversity in the world. Men and women who were left for dead on Mount Everest. Men and women who have overcome four or five stage four cancer diagnoses. Men and women who are unemployed, lost their jobs, down and out. What are the secrets and the science of leadership in crisis and in tremendous adversity? Those are my topics today. But I want to start in 1805. October, off the southwest coast of Spain, and tell you a little lesson from history. This was the great battle of Trafalgar, and Admiral Horatio Nelson was thinking about the challenge in front of him. He was outgunned, he was outmanned, and he was predicted to lose. It was the British against the mighty Spanish Armada and the French Armada. Horatio Nelson, you remember him, he was the sixth of 12 sons. He joined the Royal Navy at the age of 12. And now he's an admiral facing his toughest battle. The objective is to stop the French and Napoleon from invading Britain. If he wins the battle, Napoleon will be defeated and British naval supremacy will be established. If he loses, the British Isles are sure to be invaded. And so on that day, Lord Nelson thought, what should I do? Crisis confronts me. He thought about the history of maritime conflict, and naval battles had always been fought in parallel. You've been to Pirates of the Caribbean. You've seen how the ships line up in rows, in lines, parallel to each other, and firing cannons at each other, allowing for one side or the other to escape rapidly, and drawing to inconclusive results. On that day in October 1805, Lord Nelson met with his captains and he discussed his plans. He was outnumbered. The Spanish had 33 ships, 30,000 men, and 2,568 guns. The British had 27 ships, 17,000 men, and 2,148 guns. Admiral Nelson had lost an eye in Corsica in battle. He had lost an arm in Tenerife, but he saw the world differently and he saw this battle differently. Instead of fighting in parallel, Admiral Nelson decided to fight perpendicular. He decided to go straight at the Spanish and the French lines in two columns and try to separate the, the Spanish and the French lines into three sections that he knew he could defeat. And so that's exactly what he did. It was a tremendous innovation in naval warfare and the victory was his. On that day, he broke the Spanish and the French line. He sank 22 Spanish ships, and not one British ship was lost. There were tremendous casualties on the British side, but the British had defeated the mighty Spanish and the French armadas. Lord Nelson's place in history was secured. He suffered a gunshot wound on that day, and after being told that his fleet had won the battle, he succumbed to his injuries. His parting words, were, God, thank you, I've done my duty. Lord Nelson's broadie was brought home, believe it or not, preserved in a brandy barrel, <laughs> and a monument was erected in Trafalgar Square, and there is Nelson's statue standing 145 feet above London, immortalizing what is known in strategy and leadership as Nelson's touch. With one eye, with one arm, and with the loyalty of his troops, he saw the battle differently that day, and he won a victory for which he is remembered to this day. What is required to be a great leader in a crisis? I would submit to you that it requires the Nelson's touch. I would also submit to you that you need to be, and this is my first piece of actionable advice for you today, you need to be a farmer with a pitchfork. 
What the heck does that mean? Mark Twain in Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court observed that the greatest swordsman in England is not afraid of the second greatest swordsman in England. The greatest swordsman in England can, can handle the second greatest swordsman. They know the rules, they fight by established principles, they train against each other, they fought each other many times before. The greatest swordsman in England is afraid of a farmer with a pitchfork. A farmer with a pitchfork has nothing to lose. A farmer with a pitchfork fights any way he or she wants. And so in these times of incredible disruption, if you fight the orthodox way, if you lead the conventional way, there are challenges all around. A farmer with a pitchfork has better chances. And in fact, history bears this out. This is called the study of asymmetrical conflict. Fancy title, studied by political scientists, and they've looked at 210 major conflicts over the last several hundred years. And in those 200 major conflicts, lopsided conflicts, asymmetrical conflicts, where one side has 10 times more power than the other, they found some surprising results. When conventional tactics were used in a conventional conflict of powers where one is 10 times mightier than the other, 71.5% of the time, the stronger power wins. 71% of the time, the stronger power wins in a conventional conflict. But here's what history teaches. In unconventional conflict, when one side uses unconventional strategy and unconventional tactics and innovative approaches, the weaker side wins 63.6% .6 of the time. That means that David and Goliath, David with his slingshot, David wins 63.6% .6 of the time across the arc of history. And so I'm here to say that leaders need to be bold and innovative, and I'm going to talk to you about some of the ways that they can be, drawing on the lessons of Walt Disney himself. First actionable idea for the unconventional leader is that the best ideas and the most ideas win. Perhaps you've never heard of laughogram. Laughogram, come on everybody, you know that. That's the studio that Walt Disney started in 1921 in Kansas that went bankrupt in 1923. <laughs> Perhaps you've heard of Oswald, the lucky rabbit. Seem kind of distant to you? Well, that's right, because Oswald was Walt's first hit character, which he lost control of in a distribution dispute with Universal Studios. Perhaps you've never heard of Plain Crazy or Gallop and Gaucho. Those were the first two shorts in 1928 featuring a little character named Mickey Mouse. But Walt couldn't get distribution for those shorts and no one ever really got to see them until a character named Steamboat Willie showed up. The point of the best ideas win especially for a disruptor, is that it's the quality of the idea and also it's the quantity. Some of us have just one idea a day or in a week, and I'm here to encourage you to develop as many as you can because there is a high correlation, in fact, between the quantity and the quality of ideas. Picasso made 20,000 pieces of art. Einstein wrote 240 papers. Edison had 1,039 patents and Richard Branson has started 250 companies. Quantity counts. But where do, where do ideas come from? Some of you may be sitting here thinking and watching and wondering, but I'm not great at ideas. Ideas come from curiosity. Ideas come from, from a desire to know what's next. Ideas come from men and women and leaders who gather for two days in places like this to learn and to expand their horizons. That's where ideas come from. Walt said it best, this is a quotation, around here, we don't look backwards very long. We keep moving forward, opening new doors and doing new things because we're curious and curiosity keeps leading down new paths. The second secret of Walt Disney's leadership and of course disruptive and innovative leadership is the belief in magic. And here, in a place of worship, the belief in the mysterious. When you believe in a thing, Walt said, 
Believe it all the way. Believe it implicitly and unquestionably. And perhaps you didn't know that Walt Disney's first full-length animated feature was known widely for years in Hollywood as Disney's folly. Why is that? Well, that's because Snow White and the Seven Dwarves cost $1.5 million back in its day, 1937. It took years to produce. It was three times over budget. But when it premiered in 1937, Walt Disney believed in it. The first full-length animated feature film, it had never been done before. People thought he was crazy, he would bankrupt the studio, he would go out of business. But in 1937 it premiered, and it was the most successful movie in 1938. The last piece of actionable advice, not original, but important, Walt always told his troops, what are you waiting for? The way to get started, he said, is to quit talking and to start doing, to act and to act now. Now I told you at the beginning that I was going to share some of the secrets of leadership in crisis that I learned in my time traveling the world, meeting the world's most effective survivors and thrivers. And I want to take you to one particular place first, which is the FAA's Airplane Crash Survival School in Omaha, Nebraska. The FAA actually runs an institute, Omaha, Nebraska in the house. <laughs> the FAA actually runs an institute to train flight attendants and other safety experts on how to survive a plane crash. Now, many of you flew here today and many of you watching will be traveling this week, next week, and next month. And I wanna start with what they tell you in the very opening session at the Flight Crash Survival School in Omaha. They tell you that on your next flight, your chances of an accident and perishing are one in 60 million. So I just want everybody to relax. One in 60 million, you have to fly every day for the next 164,000 years for your ticket to come up. So we can relax. Even if you're involved in an accident, the FAA teaches, that 95.7% of the people who are in actual accidents survive. And in the most serious crashes, 76.6% survive. But what the FAA wants to teach, and what I learned when I went through a smoky cabin trying to get off the plane as fast as I could in a simulator, what the FAA teaches is what is called the rule of 10-80-10. Critical to all of you leaders when you face your next emergency, your next crisis. God forbid, not a smoky cabin, but surely an emergency awaits as the leader of any organization that you run. The theory of 10-80-10 posits that in any emergency, earthquakes in Japan, tsunamis in Southeast Asia, aviation incidents in Chicago, 10% of the people in the emergency emerge as leaders. They know what to do. They know where to go. They take care of other people and they lead others to safety. Now you're probably ahead of me here and you're thinking about that 80 in the middle of that equation. What do the 80 do? The 80 do nothing. 80% of the people in emergency situations, a fire in a building, a shooting, 80% freeze and wait for a person in a position of authority to tell them what to do. 10%, the last 10, are those who engage in what the scientists call negative or counterproductive behavior. We're gonna leave them aside. <laughs> but the most important part of the theory of 10-80-10 is to think about the surprising fact that the 10% who are leaders are emergent leaders. They are not necessarily the president of the company. They are not necessarily the CEO. They are not necessarily the vice president or the manager. In an emergency situation, in a crisis, all kinds of things happen, and the social science tells us that men and women emerge in those situations 
as leaders. The real issue is how to go from the 80% who do nothing and who freeze and move into the 10% who are emergent leaders. And there, the answer is that we can all do that. And here's how. When it comes to an airplane incident, we're going to get specific first to airplanes, and then we're going to broaden out to business and church and life and work about how to handle a crisis and how to go from that moment of behavioral inaction. That's the moment when social scientists observe people freeze like statues when something bad happens. How to get into action and to get going and to start moving. In an airplane accident, the first 90 seconds are all that matters. Because in 90 seconds, a cabin can go from survivable and breathable to a flash fire that becomes unsurvivable. And so in 90 seconds, you've got to get off that plane. The thing to do is to have a plan A and a plan B. Count the rows to the nearest exit. Count them, memorize them, and then count the rows to the next nearest exit and memorize them. Because in the dark or in the smoke or if you're disoriented, you may have to find your way using your hands and not being able to see. Don't medicate yourself. Don't blindfold yourself. Don't go to sleep with earphones in your ears when you are traveling 500 miles an hour through the air in an aluminum can filled with <laughs> gasoline. <laughs> Correlated with the gasoline is wear your shoes. Don't wear flip-flops that can fall off. Don't wear sandals, wear shoes because if you are to reach sudden impact, the shoes go flying and you may have to run across glass and hot metal and gasoline. And remember the rule of plus three and minus eight. The first three minutes of flight and the last eight minutes of flight are when 80% of the incidents happen. And finally, finally, relax. Because <laughs> as I told you, you'll have to travel every single day for the next 164,000 years to have to deal with an aviation emergency. But why go through this in such detail? There are very important le lessons in this simple story of getting off an airplane that are relevant to all of you as you lead organizations and businesses and institutions through crisis. And here I want to quickly tell you about another place that I visited, Miramar, the home of Top Gun, where the naval aviators fly and train in Southern California and where the Naval Aviator Survival School is located. And here, what they do is they teach young, young flight officers how to survive getting dunked in the ocean in a helicopter or landing in the water in an airplane. And I went through this training and I was strapped into a helicopter simulator on a big arm that was dropped into a swimming pool that then sunk to the bottom of the pool and then flipped upside down because helicopters, when they hit the water, flip upside down because the rotors are the heaviest part of the helicopter. And I can tell you that I didn't do very well the first time, but I learned some essential big lessons that I want to impart to all of you that are actionable about what to do when you inevitably get hit in the head when your business runs into trouble, when you encounter a member of your community who needs help and there's a crisis. The first lesson that they teach at Aviation Survival School is that when you are in the water, upside down and sinking, maintain your point of reference. And what that means when you're upside down in the water is to know which way the bubbles are going and which way is up. What that means is to hold on to your seat and to feel the armrest and to know that if you're sitting in the chair, you know where you are. And what it means when you're sitting in your community, in your chair, in your company, or wherever you lead and try to exert influence, it's to maintain your point of reference of where you are and most important, where you are trying to go. Because no matter how hard you get hit, no matter how hard the knock is, if you maintain your point of reference, you stay on course. It's when people lose their point of reference as leaders, buffeted by all the things that happen as influencers, that we can get lost. 
The second piece of advice that they give you in the dunking school in Miramar is to wait for the violent and sudden motion to stop. This is incredibly important because no matter what afflicts you, no matter what challenge you face as a leader, that first 30 seconds, that first three minutes, that first hour feels like it is going to go on forever and we often try in that moment to act, to do something. But if you wait for the violent and sudden motion to stop, things will settle. They always do. And that's when the calmest, coolest decisions get made. That's when the emergent leader sees the way out. That's when you can grab a hold of the team and inspire them to pursue the direction that you've set out. Third, practice realistic optimism. Now the great Jim Collins in his book, Good to Great, laid out what he referred to as the Stockdale paradox. I'm sure many of you are familiar with it. It's a classic of leadership. James Stockdale, the highest ranking officer in Vietnam serving as a prisoner of war, remarked that the optimists were not the ones who survived prisoner of war camp in Hanoi. The optimists rode their emotions up and they rode their emotions down and it was too much for them, the torture, the abuse, and the dashed hopes and dashed expectations when the peace talks collapsed and when the, the brutal beatings and torture continued. Stockdale observed that it was the realistic optimists who endured and survived and managed to lead. A realistic optimist, he said, is someone who has an unflinching sense of their surroundings, ruthlessly honest about the challenges that they face, true situational awareness, the military term, for all of the threats and the realism of those threats, but also maintains optimism about the future, hope that they will get out alive, hope that they will find a, a path. And when asked about that hope, when asked about that optimism, the prisoners of war told me that it's because of their faith in God, their faith in their country, their faith in family, and their faith in friends. Faith. Probably the most powerful survival tool and one of the most important leadership tools as well. And so here at Willow Creek and in places of worship watching today, I want to wrap up with a couple of quick thoughts uh, that come from my research and my experience and my travels about the importance of faith and belief in leadership in crisis. The power of, of faith and the power of community is undeniable, it's empirical. The research tells us that people who attend church regularly live 7.7 .7 years longer than people who do not. Now, 7.7 .7 years is a lot. If you attend once a week, it's 6.6 .6 years. If you attend more than once a week, it's 7.6 .6 years. <laughs> I know everybody's quickly doing the math. But the point is not to speak to the existence or power of God. The point is to, to speak to the power of the community and the behaviors and the leadership that come from religious organizations around the world. 80% of the world's population is involved in organized religion. That's 5.2 billion souls around the world. And that religious attendance and religious participation drives incredible psychological and social and behavioral benefits. Faith is such a powerful survival tool and it is a powerful leadership tool. <coughs> and here, I wanna end with one final observation. I was asked last night at a coffee conversation before the summit, what's the one thing, the one leadership idea to impart now today, you're going to hear all kinds of memorable phrases like get mo and like bend the curve. And, and these are meaningful. And I was taking notes backstage of all these interesting ideas and you're gonna learn so much. But if I could impart one concept to you beyond farmers with pitchforks, 
beyond the power of many ideas, beyond waiting for the violent and sudden motion to stop. It would be the advice that was given to me by one of the wisest men I know, a very famous movie director who I had the privilege of knowing in my career at ABC. And I asked him, how did you manage to lead some of the greatest teams making the greatest art and the greatest films of all time? What was your secret? And I quizzed him and I grilled him and I tried to find the secret. And at the very end, taking pages and pages of notes, he said that the one leadership secret, the one thing that unlocked the performances of all of the people with whom he worked, the one thing that gave Academy Award winning performances from his stars and, and Oscar winning performances from his photographers and made the teams do impossible things. The one thing came down to the words from E.M. Forster's novel, Howard's End. Two words and three little dots. Only connect. Connect with your fellow men and women. Connect with the mysteries around us. Connect one to many. Connect one on one. The power of your ability to connect with the people that you want to influence is the most important power of all. If you want to increase your influence, if you want to increase your boldness, if you want to be the leader you were meant to be, if you want to take the step that one step that Craig Greshel talked about this morning, only connect. Thank you very much.